All right, well, let's get to the banana punch. So we'll go ahead and kick off here. Uh, let me make sure I'm sharing the right screen. You know, typical agenda. We'll go ahead and have quick introductions of our team here. Uh, and we'll dive into this month's topic. We're going to do clean address. Uh, for those of you that touch addresses in banner or location to addresses, you'll be really excited about this new software. So we are the Banner Bunch. Uh, our team's made up of Kimmy, Mark, Tyler, uh, Teresa, oh yeah, Lori, Carl's telecommuting right now, uh, Lena, he was back manning the office, myself, I'm Gabriel, and then our, our leader, uh, Michael. So clean address, who here has heard of us talk about clean address in the past? We've, we purchased this about a year ago and it's taken us uh, mm -hmm. most of that time to get set up to where we can implement this. And we're hoping to have it into production and turned on and, and going every day uh, by the end of the month here. Uh, what Clean Address does, uh, for those of you who raised your hand, does anybody want to take a guess at what it actually is or explain? No, nobody's playing that. Uh, clean Address, in a nutshell, cleans the addresses in there. What it does, it, the way it works is we actually will get files from the U.S. Postal Service of every address that is valid to them across the nation. We'll get those on a quarterly basis so we always stay up to date. Uh, this software bolts on the banner and works very seamlessly with self-service and the in-banner forms to verify addresses as you enter them to make sure that they're up to date. Uh, we also have capabilities to run it against the entire system and clean up everything uh, that has been entered uh, in the past, which we will do when we turn this on. Uh, we also have the ability to take a spreadsheet of addresses and clean that up and then help put another spreadsheet with everything verified and uh, any messages that come out of that. It's pretty slick and it's very robust. It's made by a company named Runner Technologies. We have suspicions that it's uh, populated by a bunch of old Lucian employees because it works so well with Banner. Uh, and with Banner Schools, this is really the, the gold standard software for, for doing this sort of activity. So there's, there's big reasons why you want to use this software. And I'm sure some of you have probably run across these in the past. Uh, first off, it's going to minimize some of our data entry. Uh, for those of you that actually have to enter or maintain addresses in Banner, whether you a student entering an application or you're sitting on the back end that's making sure you just capitalize right or take out the special characters. This software does all of that. Cleans up addresses on the fly. Uh, and by that way, we we're able to enforce our data standards. We're able to make sure that everything is the same across the system. We use the same abbreviation for Boulevard, we use the same capitalization, uh, and then Verifying against the Postal Service, everything is an accurate address. So we're going to reduce a lot of our errors and bounce back mail. Pretty mailers will love this because I know right now they get a lot of mail that comes back to them because it's not quite the right address or that house doesn't exist or that sort of thing. This will prevent a lot of that. Uh, and then vicariously, because everything is going to be kind of standardized, it'll help us prevent errors also in the future because when addresses come in and use common matching, We'll be comparing apples to apples and slight misspellings will throw it off. So I'm going to go ahead and give a demo. I'll start in self-service and show you kind of how this works. Uh, nor most of our, our addresses come in through the applications. So that's what I'm going to show you. But it works the same across all self-service. Anywhere there's an address, like if you're updating your personal information or your emergency contact stuff, it works the same way. Let me go ahead and hop in there. I'm going to go ahead and create a new application from scratch. This will be nice and clean. So uh, I've gone ahead and changed in our development instance the way that uh, the addresses appear, simply because I want to make sure that you see everything that's going on with clean address. The admissions office may actually change the mailing address piece uh, just based on this behavior as well. So 
So anywhere that an, app an application has an address that it's gathering, clean address is going to plug in and, and work behind the scenes. For our standard W1 freshman web app, we've got two sections, one for permanent address and one for mailing address. I'm going to go ahead and show you this permanent address field. Like I said, I added a bunch of fields here that don't normally appear, but um, I also took away a lot of the requirements just so we can play around with this in the session. So let's just start out with a, a valid address. We all know 6500 Pacific, all right? Albany, Oregon, 97321. Uh, I'll give you my phone number if you want it, 917-4355. Oops. And I'll continue. And we're done. Clean address is done, it's an address. So to the user, if they enter that address, they won't notice anything. Uh, an applicant usually knows their correct address and they enter it in fine. But behind the scenes, when I hit continue there, clean address looked at that address and said, all right, there is a 6500 Pacific in Albany, Oregon. We didn't quite fill it out exactly right. So it went ahead and standardized it to 6500 Pacific Boulevard Southwest, Albany, Oregon. It even put in the last four characters of the zip code. It corrected the county to Lynn County. It put all that information in seamlessly behind the scenes and, and the, the applicant doesn't even notice. So it does all that and doesn't show you that it did that. It just said right. it's in. They said this is a valid address. Let's just clean it up a little. And but it doesn't it. give it to you for review. No, but I'll show you what happens if you don't hit the nail on the head. Say, yeah. The problem is that I gave it a valid address and it was really close. So let's see what happens if I give it an address. It will do this if the address is close enough for it to go ahead and match it up. If you really screw it up. Exactly. And that's what I'm going to show you next is what happens if you give it the bare minimum information. One, two, three, anywhere. I'm not going to give it anything else. And I hit continue. It's going to come back and say, this is not a valid address. You know, all right, one, two, three, anywhere, but where is that? You know, it needs to have a little bit of information so it can go out to that database of postal, uh, U.S. Postal Service addresses and verify it. So right now it's telling me, uh, try again. We need at least a zip code. How does it handle like apartment numbers? Or We're going to show you that. We'll show you. Exactly. Yeah. So let's say, all right, I'll give you the zip code. And that's all I'm going to give you. 97321. That's where I live. 123 anywhere in Albany, Oregon. And hit continue. It's going to come back. It said, all right, 97321 is in Albany, Oregon. I know that means that much. But there's no anywhere street in Albany. And so it's going to give me a message saying, I don't know this street. It's got to be, maybe it's close. It could be Anderson, it could be Angelo, it could be Anthony. You know, these are some suggestions based on what I've already input. So I'm going to give it a little bit more. I'm going to give it Anderson. I'm not even going to put the place on there. One, two, three, Anderson Street. And I have to you. <laughs> it's going to be like, all right, well, there's, there's an Anderson Street in Albany, Oregon. We're that far, uh, but one two three is not a valid range. There's no one two three house number on that street. But here are valid house numbers on that street. It could be between eleven hundred and eleven ninety nine. It could be eleven forty three, eleven eighty five. These are all valid house numbers on Anderson Street in Albany, Oregon. So it tries to help the user get to a valid address as we walk us through it. So let's let's keep going. Let's give it 11.43 and hit continue. And it comes back and it says, all right, there's an 11.43, Anderson Place Southeast, but it knows that there are suites at that address. If you're asking Kevin, what happens if there's an apartment number? It'll ask you for the apartment number. And here it says that we know that at 11.43 Anderson's Place Southeast, there are suites six through 10. You gotta choose one of those and put them in the address for it to be valid. So I'll go ahead and put sweet sets. You don't need that much. Oh yeah? 
Can you put like a number six on there, or you can just right after Anderson just put I put a number on it. Yeah. Can we actually correct street lane twos into street lane one? Well, it will too. Right. It'll okay. it'll kind of be the end of it if it's. So if I put suite six on there, and I put it on the second line there, I didn't put in anything else, and hit continue. It moved on to the next section. It got enough it got to it. standardize the address. So let's go back and look at that. Yeah, I didn't put on place, I didn't put subdivisions, mm -hmm. and now it's standardized it. 1143 Anderson Place, Southeast Suite 6, all in line one. Fix up the zip code, put in the county code. And that's what clean address does. It's pretty helpful. And so now the applicants, as they're going through this, is being asked to correct their address, and they're not allowed to move on until they've got a valid address. And when they do, it's all standardized to our standards, and it gets met, and it goes through the system clear. Question? What's it wanting for um, line two? On this one? What would be a, a okay thing to put there that would stay on that line? Uh, some addresses, the apartments are supposed to go on the second line. It really depends on how the post office expects an address. Uh, some addresses are longer. What if it was like with Kara, would that stay there? I don't know. That's a good question. This is still in testing, so we might as well check. And Kara, okay. And I apologize for this up and down. The mouse that I'm using is kind of wonky. So I'm, they accepted it. Let's go see if it stripped that out. No, it, it flipped it around. It said, the care of really belongs on the first line. Well, and that's because the post office reads the address from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. So it accepts it, but it standardizes it at the same time. Yeah. Question? So, uh, when you print labels that kind of these, usually they print off of line one and don't mm -hmm. print off of line two. So is that going to cause us problems when we print uh, labels and some things out there? Right. So that's one of the reasons why we're displaying this now. It's not in production yet. We've got a few weeks before we do get into production. Some of our business processes, we may want to double check. Like printing labels, we want to, we want to know what's going to happen if in care of appears on that first line. <laughs> uh, I would accept, expect that those are kind of the exceptions, but we want to know what happens. So this is what happens in self-service. It's pretty user-friendly. Uh, the same sort of thing happens in InBanner, IMB. And I can go ahead and show you that as well. So this ties into many of the forms in Banner that have addresses. So some of us could rattle off some of those, like spading, pee-pading, FTM then. Uh, there's a total of like 25 different forms in Banner that use this, this field. And I'm going to go ahead and show you Spaden. We can pull up my information because I fixed it this time. And if we go into address, you know, I was playing around with this earlier and we've got 6,500 something in there. But if we wanted to enter a new address, we can go in here and call it a, a permanent address. And I can do my one, two, three, anywhere example again. And you can notice that I, when I'm doing data entry in here, all I really need to do is put in a zip code uh, three, two, one, and hit tab, and it'll fill everything else in, which is really nice. If you're doing data entry, just put in the zip, don't type everything else out, because it'll fill it in for you if you're accurate. And then I can hit save. And it'll pop up the same sort of message. It looks like it's in banner now. It's not the, the clean one for self service, but it's the same message. Okay. Anywhere doesn't exist in Albany, you have to choose Anderson. And it would walk you through the same steps that we just walked through in self service to get to 1143 Anderson Place Southeast uh, if you want to do that. So can you just click on one of those? No, you have to actually type that. No, it's yeah, it's that, just suggested. That functionality is coming. They haven't written that. If it's a brand new street, like a new subdivision, is it going to be up to date like that? Now that's that's one of the uh, 
caveats to this. There's two caveats, and we'll cover those in a second. Second, uh, second, but that's one of the things you need to worry about. One thing I, I do want to show you though is that say, you know, one eleven forty three Anderson plays southeast is the one that I'm trying to put in here. But I want to do sweep five because I know that uh, clean address is going to prevent me. It only accepts sweep six through ten right now, but this. Applicant or person is just telling me up and down that they're in suite five and that is the correct address. We have the ability with this checkbox to override it and hit save. And it'll take it. Now, the trick to that is if I uncheck this, it'll check it again and say, no, 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 no. It has to be in my database. But if I want an address that I know is this, I can save it in banner. Back to what your question is, the caveat is in self-service, you don't have this override button. So if an applicant has a brand new house that was built in the past few weeks, that address isn't here because we update those post office addresses quarterly. We'll have to work out our process on how to handle those, but really those handle very minimally. The other example that I've seen a lot with clean address is uh, some, tent, some landlord chopped up a house into five different addresses, and technically they're not real addresses. Uh, those sometimes catch us as well, but they're really 0.1% of the time. This software will catch everything on a quarterly basis. It's updated, uh, and it's very slow. The other caveat that I mentioned, I mentioned there were two. The other one is that uh, for those of you that really love hidden addresses, and look at all the codes, uh, we are changing the county codes that are in there. Up to now, we've been using uh, county codes that were invented by the Department of Community Colleges and Workforce Development, CCWD up in Salem. Uh, those codes aren't USPS standards, and this software needs to have the postal office's codes for the county. So those are called FIPS, and I can't remember what they stand for, Federal Information uh, Standards. So what we have had to do is put in the county codes according to FIPS. So if you're used to putting in 002 for Benton County, the real code is OR003. Or for Lynn County, County the old code was 022, now it's, zero, it's OR043. Uh, we feel that this should be really a non-issue though, because not a clean address, always make sure that it's accurate, we'll never data enter a county code again. So let me go back to my slideshow. Nope, oh, that's not working real well. <laughs> so we touched on self-service. Um, here's some of the uh, forms in Banner that use common matching now, or uh, not common matching, use clean address now. You'll see it in go and match, I was talking about some of you earlier, about uh, doing data entry in there, Spaden, P. Payton, FTM Ben, SA Quick. Uh, there's many more, we can give you the full list if you want to submit. Uh, but pretty much anywhere there's an address, you're gonna see clean address cleaning it up. Um, and I did mention that the county code's been changing as well. Should be pretty much a non-issue, except for IR, we're gonna get it. If we have to convert out for CCWD. Any questions? Any questions about clean address or any questions about banner in general? That was a pretty quick one today and we kept the rest of the time is available for anything you want to talk about. What do you think of the software? Cool. So you'll be hearing from us. Right now it's in all our development instances. We've been testing it pretty heavily. We you know a couple minor issues that I've skirted around during this demo. Uh, but we're working to get those resolved. We're also working to clean up all of our county codes. Kimmy and Carl have been, not Kimmy and Carl, Kimmy and Tyler have been working on that. A lot of our jobs have county codes hard coded, so we have to clean up all that before we can turn this on. Um, but we're hoping to have this in production by the end of the month. Really nice. Do you think this is going to impact anybody's work? Or? Yeah, I see Danny shaking his head. I know you're just going to feel right. I just heard like three or four sides of relief out there. <laughs> <laughs> I heard a couple people like this. Yeah, the goal is now we don't even think about addresses because we can trust the software. It's going to be clean. 
we'll call it international. Oh, good point. Good, good question, Kevin. Uh, this software only works for um, U.S. postal service. Uh, Runner Technologies offers address data on uh, like something like 200 countries or something like that. Um, but we only purchased the United States because I don't think we have very many addresses coming in from India. I'm sure they do exist, but they're small enough that we don't have to pay you know, their money to verify every single one that comes in. On that screen, if you choose an, anything besides the mm -hmm. US, does that mean mm -hmm. it just turns it off basically? Right. So, what Dan is asking is out here on self service, uh, if you choose a country, it'll actually deactivate for your address. Um, because there's no override in self service, that's one of the workarounds that I've heard of. Uh, I know OSC does that when they have somebody calling and saying, Trying to submit my application, but it will not take my address. Oh, no. Don't tell us. Uh, don't tell us it happens. <laughs> it happens don't, don't tell us a workaround that we can tell us to do this. I, I shouldn't tell you the workaround. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> just you I'm just saying the there are ways to get around it. Thank you. Comes with a steep tuition. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions, comments? It doesn't have to be about doing that. So how would they get to those developing instances again? So that's a good question. Does everybody know how to get to a development instance to help test? I have all these secret URLs. All those mind boggling. All those crazy URLs. You guys do something about that. <laughs> so one of the changes we recently made, and we didn't really publicize this a whole lot. At all. <laughs> Uh, if you go out to our banner homepage, out here, we now have a link for testing. And if you click on that, it drives you way down to the bottom of this page. And you've got these banner instances. And you have access to any one of our instances. PFROG, uh, which is always a week behind from the data we pull in every Friday from production. Test, D-Test, and DevL, which are cloned on more of a quarterly basis. But if you click on one of those, then you can get to banner, you can get a big banner session, or you can get to any self-service for those test instances. Uh, this is helpful if you're helping out with the releases, admissions helps out a ton, active affairs, uh, finance, all these areas are interested in the next version of banner that are coming out, and this is where we do our work. So they help out testing there. Right now, clean address is in all of these instances, and you can help test in those as well, and see how it behaves. This is one of the changes that we're making. We're, we're slowly starting to uh, update this page and, and get a lot more useful information on it and make it a little bit more usable. Uh, so if you have any input on this page, let us know. We're listening. This page is going to become very popular if it hasn't already. Mm -hmm. uh, last weekend, I implemented a fix where you're not allowed to shortcut an open banner directly from your computer anymore. Naughty, naughty, naughty. <laughs> you weren't supposed to do that in the first place. Really? Yeah. Um, Did anybody have a shortcut directly to banner? Just Kevin. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> if you have a shortcut that goes directly to banner, you might have noticed that now when you click on that shortcut, it takes you here first. Yeah, so and you have to hit start banner or big banner. Uh, it's one extra step, but it allows us to tighten up the security around banner so that we don't have open sessions from anywhere. And again, it gives us kind of a a funnel on all the sessions to banner. This is something that we did about a week ago and, and nobody really mentions anything. So uh, we tend to try to communicate our our changes, especially if they're gonna be bigger, like the hotkeys. We got infected by hotkeys. Yeah. A few people raising their hands. I hope you don't hate us or swear too much. I do. <laughs> I, yes, I, mean, I, I really miss control. Control. Oh, what did that do? The list of values, yeah. Control S. Control S for save instead of F10. That's a big change. Shift page down. Shift page down to control page down. Control page down. I use more of them now because now I have a sheet of the new ones taped inside yeah. my computer. I'm like, oh, I didn't even know that one existed. So I got used to the ones I used before already, and I use the ones that I used. Before. 
Yeah, we, we really, really, really uh, appreciate your understanding on that change. I know that that one, if your brain's hardwired to shift page down, it's, it's a little tough to get used to the new hotkeys. Uh, that's just one of those things that we were maintaining for very little reason. Uh, and now that now we're publicizing what the, the baseline hotkeys are, and we've made a little more awareness to it. Uh, like Kevin said, some people are using them more. How was the communication on that change? Because we're trying to get a better sense on if we're reaching everybody across campus and people know that things are going to happen ahead of time uh, so that nobody's really caught unaware when we do make the change. I think they started until I actually did it. Until Monday came and then your, your keyboard was broken. <laughs> but the mental synapse is slowly rewiring. We're, we're using the banner current users group pretty heavily to send out a lot of the information. We're trying to be aware of faculty that may or may not be getting those and we're not be, and who's getting information across campus and who's not because we will be making more changes over time and I want to make sure that people are aware that those are coming so that uh, first off we just know about it and, and second if the, the business process has to change because that's something that we can plan in advance. Uh, or, or if we're going to make a change that's going to hugely impact an area, we find out before that change happens and we can help plan ahead or, or even postpone if we have to. I think if people come to these meetings, it definitely helps. If it's just an email, mm -hmm. yeah, it's not. And the invite figures go out to Vander Current users, and I've, I've learned yeah. that sometimes faculty don't get those, or I'm um, trying to have more communication with students as well. Um, I'm, we're going to get in touch with the Student Leadership Council and start getting their input on things. Uh, maybe we can build a focus group for when we change self service. I don't know. And we've gotten a lot of great feedback on the banner bunch. These, these are fun. We like doing these. Um, what sort of banner bunches would you like to see in the future? What sort of areas would you like to learn about? And then these, we're always looking for more ideas for these sessions. Some of the ideas that we have is when self-service starts to change the look and feel of that, which will probably happen here in the near future, uh, we'd like to do a band a bunch on that before the change actually happens, those sorts of things. Um, or if new functionality is coming out or going back to baseline, those sorts of things we'd like to do sessions on. Um, I know you've got waitlisting coming up or prereqs. I don't know if those are more too technical or too specific to one area, but we've thought about those sorts of things. Or even functionality that maybe we don't use a whole lot, like quick flow or workflow, those sorts of things. Quick flow my banner, too. Quick flow my banner. We can look at Quick Banner or something like that. That'd be a good one. Those are good little chunks that we can do in these. Any other questions, comments? It's a quiet group this morning. That's what happens when we don't have coffee in the back. Mm -hmm. That's great. <laughs> well, I don't have a whole lot of stock questions. What, what can you guys think of that maybe we need to talk about, or should I just end it early? We've thought about having like point questions. That we could ask ourselves. So my thought was asking about communication. But. All right. Well, if there's no other questions or comments, I think we'll just go ahead and end it early. I'll put this out on the website so anybody can get on YouTube. What about the Banner Baseline project since it's a Is that done? Yeah, we can give a status update on that as well. Is everyone aware of the, the Banner Baseline project? Raise hand if you are. All right, about half of us. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware, or for everybody else, uh, the status update, we've kicked off a, a really big project to bring, bring Banner closer to the way Elysium delivers it. Uh, being such an old Banner school, in fact, we were the first community college in the nation to adopt Banner in 1991, Banner 1.0 or even earlier. Uh, a lot of the functionality wasn't there at the beginning or we were used to an old IBM system that we had before that. So we've changed Banner over the years because we have access to those, we can do that. Uh, what happens though when you do that is over time, 
the system that you're maintaining, the system that we're training on gets farther and farther away from what the company actually delivers. And then at this point, 26 years on, it's, it's becoming unmaintainable, unsustainable to, to continue doing that. Uh, we've built a lot of really cool functionality in the system. Uh, we don't want to just like delete that information or, or, or uh, try to move away from that. What we want to do though, is take some of those chunks like waitlisting. Uh, we built our own waitlist system for registration and turn on the baseline delivered functionality for waitlisting. We make that transition from a homegrown waitlist system to delivered functionality from the leasing. Um, that's a good example because there is functionality that matches it. So we can make that switch. Uh, one of the switches we did about six months ago was from class information and grading to factory self-service, which is very similar. It wasn't exactly the same, but it had most of the same functionality. And so we can bridge that gap and, and uh, be able to spend more of our time focusing less, uh, spend less of our time focusing on fixing things that are broken in the pieces that we built ourselves and more of our time focusing on turning on cool and perfect functionality for systems like DegreeWorks or Elucid Mobile, those sorts of things. Um, so we plan on spending most of our bandwidth over the next year evaluating all those homegrown pieces of banner and changing them to be the way that Elucid delivers it or finding other ways to meet that functionality or I'm sure some of them are just obsolete we've never used in years and don't need to keep maintaining. Those sorts of things. Question. Yeah, the rosters have. Class rosters, like in faculty self-service. So uh, faculty self-service does have the class lists. Um, it's not the same, not the same as the old class information and grading, though. Uh, what do you use class rosters for? The guys use it for attendance a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think use it for like you look at classes, except for it was all in one place. Right. So I believe the one has come up is the ability to export it. That's the one I've heard the most. Copy yeah. and pasting the class list into like a spreadsheet or exporting it or something like that. Uh, you, added, you added a CSV file from the, there's a banner report for a class, mm -hmm. class list. Yeah. Which is, what is it? Yeah, right. So and some of the ways that we bridge that gap in functionality between what we home built on class rosters and what's delivered by Lucent, uh, for most people, just having that list in fact and self service is not. Uh, or sometimes they would copy paste a little bit into Excel if they needed to for uh, attendance tracking. Um, for people that needed more information like email addresses or phone numbers, that sort of thing, there's a banner job SWRCLLS uh, that will output a CSV based on a CRM. Uh, those are a couple of the ways we've done that. Now for attendance tracking, also something to keep in mind is that as we get closer to a baseline version of Banner, uh, we can upgrade to Banner 9, which has attendance tracking built in, and it's very slow. Uh, we're just not quite there yet. And that's why you guys wouldn't build anything right on top of what we have now. Yeah, and I'd, I'd love to come sit with you guys and watch how you're doing attendance tracking uh, and try to see if there's better ways to handle what we're doing already. And one thing that we see with a lot of faculty is that we simply want to be able to print out a list, walk in the classroom, and take a picture. Right. Just, just as simple as that. I just want to print my list and you see who's here. Yeah. Um, and that very simple kind of request is I think where we see a lot of frustration of I don't want to have to fire up the podium, I don't want to have to log mm -hmm. into something, I just want to print this. And right, and some people really like that type of paper. Yes, yes, right. because, because honestly, if a lot of them, the times, they, they don't use their podiums during that mm -hmm. 50 minutes. And the time it takes to turn the podium on, set it up, log it in, for them is a loss of class. Mm -hmm. And they want to be able to walk in, prepare, and ready to roll with that piece of paper. And so it's, you know, from their perspective, I think it seems like such a really simple thing to do that they've been mm -hmm. doing for 15, 20 or more years. Right. Um, and they they really struggle with the loss of what seems like a very simple way to remain functional in the classroom without it interfering with their course time. So, right. is that a pretty accurate? Yeah, and, and also some of the part time faculty that 
necessarily have banners or just have self serve, but it just gets kind of yeah. A lot of my yeah. guys aren't college mainstream guys, they're the industry guys that come and teach teaching. And so they don't have a lot of base knowledge that we kind of assume. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they won't ever. Yeah. No. They come in, they teach for us, they do a fabulous job, mm -hmm. and they're gone. So is um, there any reason why we can't have the tab back and take everything out of it with the faculty and advising? Does that would be against the back to baseline movement that the president and VPs have signed up on. If you want to change but, but, I, but I think that's just an add-on. I, I would think though that, that what you're describing, I, I taught a class last term and I went into WebRunner and printed out my class list before each class. So that's what they're asking for. So, so, I, so I don't know why they just what I really like to do is I'm saying it is yeah. that that means class. maybe it's a training <laughs> issue. Maybe they just need to sit right. down and show them how to do it. Well actually it's not the class list. They can no, she's, yeah, she's talking about, well, we actually listed out and actually mm -hmm. had your, your days. <coughs> so based on the term, based on your class, and that's an actually said, term. you actually yeah. had days yeah. that were marked on the So guys, so part of it is, it was homegrown, so we have to tell people, <laughs> only submit your grades in Internet Explorer. At the same time, we're telling people, use Gmail. And by the way, Chrome is really nice. And, and use Mozilla for Moodle. But use, use Explorer for grades. So it's moving to the banner product means it's tested on multiple browsers. Uh, so trying to move to something that's that spans browsers and technology. So if we bring something back, we go back to saying, only use this uh, one browser. Well, if the answer is no, the answer is no. I just yeah. tell them the answer is no. I just want mm -hmm. to ask the question for you. Right. Well, what, I, what I'd like to do I is come back there and help. I building mm -hmm. a lot of my secretarial time building one for the honor of you. It was just a huge waste. Yeah. If, if you'd like, I, I would really like to come sit with you and watch your process. Uh, and see what sort of improvements. I mean, it really helps us to see it from your eyes and watch your fingers work. Uh, we can make all sorts of assumptions back in the IG office, but we really don't know 100% how you use Banner. I'd love to see that. Uh, because that might be eye opening and allow us to say, oh, well, there's this other feature we don't have turned on in Banner, something like that. Yeah. yeah, we can make those sorts of changes in process and get it working more efficiently for you. Well, back in the day, back in the day, we used to five Right, and now you gotta do one at a time. And and I and it's a it's a bigger process because those who show up in this are not constructed. Mm -hmm. So it's like no CRM file, input the CRM, and I right. it, it, it it's a lot more time consuming, which is okay. I can pay for my time, <laughs> but there's other things that don't get done because it's a lot. Well and I want IT to work for I want technology to work for us. It it shouldn't be a barrier, it should be making us more efficient. That's our goal. So let me meet up with you after this, and we'll, we'll go walk through that and see what we can do to make it make it improve. Well, some of the stuff is back with this issue. I'm just familiar with that. It's stuff there with that. Well, and we want to hear it all. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I, and I think, it's, I think it's really important in terms of these places where identifying when is the, what functionality was actually lost and what functionality is there. Mm -hmm. People just aren't finding it or they're not trained on it. Mm -hmm. And that I think that all comes from that understanding of how faculty in the classroom mm -hmm. were using various aspects of banner that's now in self-serve. And and it may be that for they go into self-serve and they go, can't find it, must not be there. Yeah. But maybe it is there. And so well, those and conversations are really important. One of the things we learned from moving away from class information and reading to the baseline faculty self-service uh, is that we need to do a better job of change management. Making sure people have training, making sure that we've done the analysis to understand what need is there and what value does it have before the changes or, or, or more sort of gone. Uh, so that we don't end up having these sorts of issues. Well one thing is advantage self-serve for the faculty when you're in those classes is there's a perceived ability to use it the whole class and it opens up and get explored. So I'm teaching them they come to me to just copy that, paste it into their group wise, and then they can but they think that's all silly because it says, well I can just do it. I have instructions on the set your default 
email yeah. client to BGP. Yeah, that's a that's a setting on your computer. You can say that. You click that. If, if you're logged into your email, it will open up a Gmail page yeah. with that entire list. That BCC. I don't know how to do because I can show them all. Yeah, right. I sent that out to all faculty too. The yeah, because yeah, I sent that to you know, about two months ago. Yeah, yeah. Right. But yeah, well, there is a way to change that. Support staff. Is there a is there a distribution list for the support staff, or do you get faculty all emails? Or? Only under the banner. I just send yeah, it. I send it to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I'll make a post and be like, everyone. "Here's how you change your default." Since we're a Gmail school, we're all yeah. logged into it anyway. Right. Well, well, maybe we can the even email get functionality in in faculty faculty self service. When you click that, it. it uses the client server. <laughs> Default email, email, whatever that is. And for a lot of us, we've never bothered to change that, so it'll automatically look for Outlook, right? Yeah. Since it's all Microsoft. Right? Um, but you can change that to be Gmail. So I that, mean, it, I mean, if I have instructions, I can go ahead and do it, right? I can help you. Yeah, right. I, if you're a lot like me, first thing you do is log into your email and get in. Yeah. Yeah. And it's open all day, all day long. So exactly. you can chat with everybody, you can you're checking your email all the time, it's always open. It, it, it's important to remember too that the resending it to everyone that's that's one strategy for reaching mm -hmm. and you will reach a lot of people you will not reach everyone there will be folks who simply don't check or they see that subject line and go eh, and they ask mm -hmm. right. that's what they'll say yeah. 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 because I never had to do anything that I mm -hmm. understood was actually I was in banner I didn't even know I was in so they will delete that before they even open it. So this, yeah. the multiple ways of reaching, whether it's through the admins and secretaries, and it's through email, and it's through academic affairs, and it it has to be this multiple points of contact before you can really raise the number of people you actually connect with. And that's the sort of thing that we're very aware of, or uh, paying attention to right now, is how we're communicating and who we're hitting with who we're missing. If you have any suggestions or input on how we can do better, let us know. Well, it is funny what she says mm -hmm. is true. A lot of my guys yeah. don't understand what my brother is handling. Yeah. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, there are two separate systems and one link downloads to the other. They have no idea that they are and so well disguised. It, it yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, they don't. They're absolutely. I can tell you all kinds of practice that say, I've never touched Tanner. But that that is a good point that that we we are trying to use multiple channels and this is one of them and I appreciate you know hearing that. Absolutely. For some faculty, the first place they go for every question. Is <laughs> right. Right. every question? I've been on the desk looking at computer tables. I mean, I'm the mm -hmm. first line of tech support. And if they lose their links to put their outcomes in, when I can't find my link, why? Well, because it looks like I have a problem. It's my desk. So, yeah. our, when you think about support staff, mm -hmm. our, our admins, our secretaries, the people in this room genuinely are what keep this whole institution afloat along with you guys and so when that kind of i can't get a response i can mm -hmm. tell you we can get one mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. very cool thank you i really appreciate you guys coming to this because like michael said this is one of our channels to to try to communicate and train other questions anything else yeah, are you going to bring donuts to the July meeting? <laughs> <laughs> I will pay attention ahead and see if conference services <laughs> is open for the next banner bunch. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Everybody excited on the little case? It's in the back. Okay.